Good morning. So happy for you guys to join us here. Day two of Surface Prep 101. I'm Tom Griffin. We've got Dave Bingham. And uh, this morning we're going to be talking about concrete prep. Grinding, shot blasting, uh, when to use which type of surface prep, you know, what's the end goal um, with what you're looking to do with the concrete, uh, blasting, polishing, concrete hardness, and of course CSP. So um, we're going to get going today, but uh, the chat function is being monitored. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in, text them to us, call the home office if you don't have access to be able to type those questions in. We're really here for you guys today, and we want to make sure that you get the most value out of this training as possible. Outstanding. Thank you, Tom. Uh, again, my, my name is Dave Bigham. And to start off with, before we get into the actual equipment and some of your options, we're going to talk real quick and have a review about these comparator chips I'm holding in my hands. Um, we call them iCry chips for short, which is short for International Concrete Repair Institute. These chips, you can buy them from iCry. And I highly recommend if you're a contractor to go out and buy a set right now. And I'm not getting paid by International Concrete Repair Institute for this commercial, but I'm going to tell you why you should go buy a set right now. If I was Dave's um, surface prep of Denver, Colorado, I would certainly buy this before I bought any piece of equipment because I do a lot of what is called managing your customer's expectations. And I think that our group as a, as a general population, I'm just going to put my arms around everybody, we don't do a very good job of that. And I'll tell you why. If you're my customer or the GC and you hire me to shop blast or grind the floor, um, I don't really know what it is that you expect. It's possible that this is what the GC, GC thinks that I'm going to give you for 25 cents a square foot. I, on the other hand, am thinking in the conversation in the trailer that this is what you're going to get. Well, those two are nowhere close to each other. So what happens if I shot blast or grind 100,000 square feet and then I'm done and I go, okay, I'm done. And the GC goes, well, that's not what I wanted. I wanted something that he had visualized in his head that you couldn't see. Now there's a lot of finger pointing. Maybe there's nobody, nobody gets paid. Does the contractor, as do I as a contractor have to start over? Is there renegotiation? It's real simple. This is an industry standard. So if I wrote in my contract that I was gonna provide a CSP one, and I showed him to this in that first meeting or the first discussion and said, this is what I'm gonna give you for X, amount of dollars per square foot. And he said, well, no, 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 that's not what I want. I want, I want this one. Well, I'm not gonna do that for the same amount of money. So then the negotiation and everybody's happy at the beginning. And if I wrote and we had agreed on a number one and that contractor left and went to Cincinnati and a new guy came in and I completed the job and he went, whoa, whoa that's not what I wanted. You could pull out the contract and say, this is what's written in the contract. This is what was signed and agreed from both sides. This is what I provided. You can see the difference. You, you win. It's a, there's no argument at that point. So having these is the best way to manage your customer's expectations, keep yourself out of trouble, and really to build a better trusting relationship at the beginning of a job. I cry chips, International Concrete Repair Institute. We tend to refer to these as uh, comparator chips because you compare the chip to what you're doing on the floor. Yep. Thanks, Tom. And if and you guys have questions about this or what I'm talking about as far as managing your customers' expectations, ch uh, chat that in and we can talk about that later in another segment or you could talk to Tom or myself personally after the video. And as well, you can um, dial in to the national um, hotline and we are just full of industry experts. If the phone rings at national and somebody answers the phone, you guys are going to get a chance to talk to somebody that can actually help you, that knows what they're talking about and give you the right direction and the solutions that you're looking for. Well, Dave, and I love that you said that that's one of the first things that you're going to go out and buy, even before you buy a machine. Uh, I know just looking from signups, we've got a lot of uh, 
sales reps out there for coatings. We've got a lot of guys who are getting into this industry for the first time. And when you're talking to a coatings manufacturer, they're gonna want a specific CSP on the ground in order for, to guarantee that performance of their product. So those chips are a perfect way to be able to say, look, Mr. Manufacturer, I've done exactly what you said. So even when you're telling a customer, if it's somebody's home garage, this is what this product calls for, this is what I'm gonna give you, you put it all in the contract, protect yourself. If that product ever fails, you can go back and say, look, I did what I needed to do, or in the end, hey, I know what I needed to do and I made sure that we did it, and you can compare the work that you've done to that chip and know absolutely. Exactly correct, Tom. The next question that I think Tom and I answer on a daily basis, multiple times a day is, um, hey, National, should I buy a grinder? Should I buy a shot blaster? What's the best tool for me to buy? Well, I'm a salesman, so I say both. <laughs> and in honesty, that's the actual <coughs> answer. You don't use a hammer to screw a screw in. So they have different purposes. They're meant to do different things, even if the output is similar. So exactly what Tom's saying is, I use the analogy, uh, being a surface press prep contractor, you have tools, just like a mechanic. If you took your car to a mechanic and you pulled it into a shop and he has this great big huge toolbox, which would be your van and your trailer or your truck, and all the mechanic has is one 916 wrench and he says, I'm gonna fix your car with all of my tools, this is my tool. Well, you're probably not gonna let him work on your car. Being a contractor is kind of the same way. You need more than one tool. If there was one tool that solved all of your problems, then we'd have a catalog with one page in it. So understanding, we tend to ask a lot of questions. What is your business model? What are you trying to do? What, what's the problems that you run into? What's the solution looking for? We ask a lot of questions so we can talk to you about the value prop and the surface profile and the ability to reach certain CSPs for each machine that fits you best. But what you'll find is in some situations, one machine, the grinder is much better. And in another situation, um, a shop blaster is much better. So there's a lot of communication to get to that correct answer to give you guys the right answer. That's very true. So what is going to be one of the big differences when we're talking about going back to those chips? If you're looking at some of those higher CSPs that you need, a grinder is never going to get you there. If you're looking at you know, a five, a grinder can't do that, but a shop blaster can. If you're looking for a lower, like a one, it's a little harder to get that with a shop blaster because it just impacts so much harder. So maybe a grinder is a more appropriate tool. Um, on top of that, when you're talking about what are you doing with the concrete? What is the end result? If you're doing a clear seal coat, shop blasting is not the way to go just the mechanical method of it going up and down, you're going to create some cornrows. And if all you're gonna do is do a clear coat on top of that, then those cornrows are gonna be evident once that clear coat's down and your customer's not gonna be happy. Yeah, nobody likes the aesthetics of the stripes on the floor with a shop blaster if you can see them. Yep, but with a grinder, you're gonna have a very even surface profile and it's gonna look beautiful when you're done. So there's definitely uh, different methods that have different results. If you're gonna be putting down a really thick self-leveling coating, um, then a shop blaster is great because those cornrows, those highs and lows, the differences in the CSP don't really matter. And on top of that, the more aggressive profile is gonna help that coating adhere better in the long run. Agree with that, Tom. So one of the things where we split right away is when we talk about the value prop or your return on investment for each machine. There's things that a grinder can do that a shop blaster can't do. And likewise, there are things that a shop blaster can do much better, much more efficient that a grinder can't accomplish. And I, I actually, I'm a shop blasting guy from way back, you guys. It's just in my soul. But as I've progressed through my 25 year career, I certainly understand the value prop and the reason why we sell so many grinders, especially with the national grinders like this A274-4, it's a soft start, variable speed, 110 volt machine that I can, I can remove glue with it, I can take a thin set with it, I can open up a floor, I can polish with it. A lot of those things that I just said, you can't do with a shop blaster. But at the same time, if I showed up to do a two car garage, 
um, I can't lift this out of I can't lift this grinder out of the back of the truck by myself. And when I'm done grinding the floor, which takes a lot longer than a shop blaster, I have to vacuum up the surface because the vacuum is only going to take up the ambient dust. Typically, vacuums don't have enough lift to pull the dust off the surface, so it's going to be a slower process. Where this shop blaster weighs just over 100 pounds, um, I'm a pretty strong guy. I can lift it out and set it on the ground. You should probably get help if it's over 50 pounds, but I legitimately could actually pick it up, set it down, or put it back in the truck by myself. And once I'm done shop blasting uh, the garage, really you just run a sweeper magnet, pick up any of the loose shot that might be left, and I'm done. So you have to decide wh where's the benefit and where is the, where is the solution that you're looking for. So if you're asking for a solution, you have to figure out all the steps that's going to get you to the answer to the question that we're asking, which is the best way to go. Tom, can we talk a little bit about, um, a little more specifically about some of the tooling and the value prop behind the national uh, grinding machines, whether it's 8274-4 or, or whether some of it's the larger machines? Yeah, of course. So national has spent years developing a great set of tooling that works on our grinders, whether it's the Helix, the 8274-4, or the GP700 and its bigger brother, the GP3000. So the Dash 4 can surface prep, but it can also polish. So we've got diamonds, diamond tooling, which is actual diamonds embedded in a resin matrix. And as you grind, that resin wears away, exposing the diamonds, and that's how your machine works and grades the floor. Can you show us how they... On the bottom of the Dash 4, it's actually really simple. We've used magnets to hold them in place. And a lot of guys say, well, I'm worried those are going to come off. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. And there we go. So imagine that, but 400 pounds of pressure on top of it. You're never going to get these off. And if you're still worried, you can bolt them in from the back. But it's usually not necessary with the diamond tooling. You can bolt them in. Another great option that we have are braised diamonds. I was actually talking with uh, our guys that are joining us here today live, and we were talking about what these really aggressive diamond patches are for. So these are braised diamonds. So if you need to rip up a coating or you need to profile concrete really, really fast, these diamonds are gonna do it. Those, all of those diamonds are exposed. There's no resin to wear away. The diamonds are 100% exposed all the time. So they're gonna shred that floor and you're gonna be able to get out and move on with it. Obviously not every situation calls for this, but aggressive coatings or a very quick surface <coughs> prep, if you've gotta get in and out for a time sensitive job and you can charge for it, these are a great way to go. We offer two different versions of those. You saw the disc version. Um, if you notice your concrete has a lot of highs and lows in it. We also offer a smaller trapezoidal that allows your machine to get into those highs and lows. We also worked really hard to come up with a tooling holder. So these will hold your carbide chips, they'll hold your PCDs, they'll hold micro PCDs, and we have a whole range of options. All of these are different levels of aggressiveness with different purposes. And all of these fit on the bottom of the 8274-4 and the Helix grinder. And they all fit here onto the same hubs that are on the bottom of both machines. Yeah, so we, we, have, we were talking about the ability to take up glue. I can strip up, you know, really thick epoxy coatings with these little micro PCDs, or I can use a one-up PCD for taking up um, mortar or two up if the concrete underneath is a little bit softer and want to spread out that head pressure on two. So already we're showing you guys, uh, there's a lot of things that this grinder can do right off the bat to solve a different problem on every single job. So on Monday I can take up glue, on Tuesday I can rip up epoxy, on Wednesday I could just prep an old dirty concrete floor we're starting to move into, oh, I can see all of the things that this machine can do for me. And on top of that, it can polish up to a 3000 mirror finish polish. But I think one of the most unsung, um, ignored benefits of this machine is a little switch right here on the side 
So how many times have you guys gone into an older home or an office, you have no idea in that office where that circuit breaker is, so you can actually dial this machine to 15 amps and with the soft start, it's slowly gonna pull those amps up and it's never gonna go above 15, so you're not gonna trip breakers. But let's say you go into my garage at home, I know I've got a 20 amp circuit in there and you can actually dial it to a 20 amp, allow it to pull that full amount and get higher productivity. This is a great feature on a machine that isn't prevalent out there in the market. So the entire country of Canada and a lot of the really older homes along the East Coast, uh, if you guys know your history, we kind of started on the East Coast and, and moved across the country. Uh, and we got f stranger and flakier as we got uh, into California and developed there. <laughs> um, and I'm in Colorado, so I'm a little bit flaky and a little bit East Coast. We're a little bit of everything. But uh, those older homes, they, they tend to have 15 amp breakers. And then, like I said, the entire country of Canada has 15 amp breakers. So if you run into that, most machines on the market will allow the motors to pull up to 20 amps. This feature that Tom's talking about is a really, really nice feature. Being able to limit your amp draw to 15, it's a real lifesaver. It's, it's a really, really nice feature. Well, and rental companies, I think that was one of the biggest things I've heard is, you know, there's a big grinder manufacturer out there. They're very prevalent in the rental world. And I hear a lot of complaints about how many amps their machines draw and they're constantly tripping breakers. This is the perfect rental machine because you're able to control that and guarantee to your customer that that's not going to happen. Tom, do you want to turn on this grinder for a minute? Yeah, and I think we'll turn on this grinder, run it for a little bit. I believe it has some 25 um, super segs, which is yep. a um, single trapezoidal segment. And the matrix is super soft. And the reason why I chose that is um, the concrete in my warehouse here is about 7,000 PSI. It's super duper hard. so. We actually want to be able to cut into it. So we're choosing the right diamond for the application. Let me get down here and plug this. All right, guys. So not the biggest grind in the world, safety first. Always have your switch on. I mean, I really only need them for the shot blaster, but safety first. Uh, this does have forward and reverse. It's got on off and it's got variable speed. So here we go. So you guys are gonna see that Dave's putting down some weights for me. You've got two sets. Typically, we only ever run them with one. If you've got really soft concrete, you can pull all the weight off of the head. You guys are going to see that this is an active planetary, meaning it's driven by a Kevlar belt. So it leaves a very even, very consistent scratch pattern. And because they're driven, they're going to just scrape over whatever's already there. As you guys can see the production on this already, on this concrete. So forward and reverse really has to do with wear on diamonds, but also doing edges along the wall. You're able to control it. So this machine is gonna pull one way on forward. It's gonna pull the other way on reverse. So you can actually set it so that your machine is bumping into the wall. So that you're able to get as close to those edges on the job as you want. A lot of guys like to run the machines in forward and reverse to evenly wear the diamonds, which I think is, uh, a really good thing to do with our counter rotationals. I think on here you get pretty even wear across the board, but. And you guys, this machine actually is modular. You can uh, pull a pin, a pin and quick disconnect the cords. They just unplug and unhook your hoses and the handle separates. You can unbolt your four side weights that you can put to use for extra head pressure. So technically you can take this machine apart and disassemble it as well. Yep. So. 
if there's no questions on the Dash 4, I think we might move on, show what our shop blaster here can do, the A95. Sure. Talk about that and we'll get Dave plugged in. We're, we're loaded with shot, right, Tom? Yep. Okay. And I put uh, shot on the bottom of it, so we oh, don't uh, it. Awesome. <laughs> hit right. everybody with shot. So what we're going to demo demonstrate right now is our A95, our Apex Series Shot Blaster. This is a 110 volt machine, and I want you guys to kind of compare the difference in the profile and the cleanup. Um, you should see that right away. Um, like I said a little bit earlier, I'm I'm a big Shot Blast guy. I love Shot Blasters because I understand how quick and efficient they are, and they clean and profile in one step. That's a big, big deal. The fact that it, it preps the floor and, and it's clean all at the same time is a huge advantage in my, in my opinion. I, I like what it can do and how quickly it can do it, and I can adjust my CSP by, because this is a manual machine, I can adjust it mostly by how fast I move the machine. I could change the size of the shot for a smaller shot or a larger shot for a higher impact. But really the main difference that adjusts your profile is how fast you can move the machine or how fast you choose to move the machine. So Dave, when you're shot blasting, why would you use one size of shot versus another? And would <coughs> you ever mix them? You can. Uh, that's uh, my oldest trick as a, uh, a demo sales guy for years is shot basically for a portable machine starts at about 170, which is very small and it goes all the way up to 460, which is very large. And in most cases, you wouldn't use 460 in a machine this small. The clearances aren't large enough. Those are designed for bigger machines with a different style blast wheel and different style um, shot valves. But 170 is, I use the analogy, it's like throwing marbles against the wall. It takes a long time to cover the wall, and it doesn't hit very hard, so it doesn't do a lot of damage to the wall, but it gives lots of hills and valleys for a really good mechanical bond. Let's jump up from one, 170, we'll go 230, 280, 330. It's kind of the middle of the road. I kind of preach that's like an all-season all season tire. It does good in rain, snow, whatever. It works pretty good for everything. So it's a popular size. Everybody likes, likes it because it works for just about everything. It's like throwing a baseball at the wall. It doesn't take near as long. You still get a lot of good hills and valleys for that mechanical bond you're looking for, but it, it speeds you up. So if I was Dave's contracting service and I had a shop blaster, I typically would mix 330 and 280 or 280 and 390. And the reason why I do that is the smaller shot will do a little bit better job of cleaning and it'll give you a little bit better profile and the larger shot will actually help impact and speed up that process. So mixing it is a great idea. Um, if you think that you need 460 or something that large to impact the surface that greatly with a machine this small, you're using the wrong machine. The shot blaster isn't meant to be a concrete removal tool. It's a prep tool. If you want to do concrete removal, you should use a planer, a scabbler, um, a scarifier. You shouldn't be using your shot blaster to take up that much concrete at, at that rate. So we're going to turn it on. And Tom's going to get my back for me. So you guys, the handle's height adjustable. Um, you can actually even turn it around if you need to get real tight spaces. Tom's preloaded the uh, magnets at the bottom for me and filled up the hopper for us. All right. I'd also like to point out one thing that a shot blaster does really well over a grinder because they all have their benefits is a shot blaster will clean out the joints and any holes in the floor. I, I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but there used to be, there was a redhead or a concrete anchor in the floor and they've it's probably a rack or a room or something here in this warehouse in this spot. That's full of dirt and it's really dirty. If I run the grinder over it, it doesn't prep inside of it, and it probably packs more dirt in there. Do you think that they can see that? 
Nick? So I'm going to blast over it, and what's going to happen is it's going to clean out just like a joint. It's going to clean out all the sides. So I'm not going to roll any dirt into my coating or and anything that might cause a disbonding. It's going to disappear. I actually have a customer here in Denver, and I went out to a job site. He's a, a big proponent of grinding. And we got to the job site, and we, I showed him the shop blaster. We did some work with it. He was like, yeah, that's good. I don't know if I love it. And I said, let's talk about expansion joints and things like Dave was just talking about. And we did a couple passes over the expansion joints, and he looked at it and said, the return that that machine is going to give me and my crew makes it worth every dollar. So I'm not just talking about that, but all shop blasters in general, he grinds the majority of the garage and then has a guy do his expansion joints and some edge work with this because he knows that the way that they put down the coating, he's able to get now a whole additional garage done every day simply because they're not on their hands and knees edge grinding and crack chasing. And another benefit that I always tended to lean toward um, early in my career with shot blasting is steel shot as a consumable is much cheaper than diamonds as a consumable. The shot's going to impact the surface, rebound back up, fall back into the hopper over and over. Now over time, the shot's going to impact and little pieces are going to fracture off of it. And it's going to get sucked into the dust collector with the dust, but you still have a majority of that piece of the shot and it's going to keep running through until it's gone. We actually have charts for um, diamond wear and life expectancy. And then we also have charts that'll tell you how much shot you're going to consume uh, per square foot and how long your wear parts in the machine are going to last. We can provide that if anybody already has equipment or they're thinking about buying some equipment, we can provide that so it can help you make a decision as well. Um, so Tom, we've talked a little bit, mostly we've talked garage, 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 because these are smaller machines. What, what happens if I come to you and I say, Tom, I want to buy a piece of equipment, but I have 20,000 square feet to do or 10,000 square feet? Then we're going to start looking at some of the bigger grinders and shot blasters out there. And the reason is, it's not that you can't do a big job with a small machine, but how expensive is labor out there, guys? We're, you have to make money on a job. So when you're out and you're bidding a job, finding the right machine to match production rates, with a comfortable amount of man hours that you're comfortable with in bidding and that the customer is okay with you taking their floor because it's not like if you're prepping a floor and shop blasting the customer is going to be able to be walking around and doing their thing while you're blasting the floor so that floor is out of commission and and there's a lot that goes into it but when you're talking about a much bigger job then you're going to be starting to talk about the production rates of the gp700 or the gp3000 when we get up into these bigger grinders that do multiple hundreds of feet per hour or uh, the bigger shot blasters that can do up to 2,000 feet an hour. Those are the things that, you know, these smaller machines are just the entry level versions of some of these bigger guys. The principles of how these work are all the same. The tooling that's available for them is the same or very similar. So it's just matching the correct machine to the job. So if Dave came to me and said, hey, Tom, I've got to prep a 20,000 square foot warehouse and they need it done overnight. I would hope they would never say that, but they want it ground. Then we'd be talking about the GP3000 or we'd be talking about probably the 3398 or the A97. But these machines all work on those same principles, like I said. So it's just matching the ex customer's expectation, your timing expectation, and what the end result is going to be and what you guys will find real quick, too, is that <clears throat> especially contractors are first getting into this business, um, they'll start with smaller equipment. It's, it's a good investment that you're still going to use no matter how much you grow. And as, you're, as you expand out in this business world of service prep, your 110-volt shop blaster becomes a companion machine to the larger blasters because you can use it in small hallways, small bathrooms, you know, tight areas. You can't get that bigger blaster. Same thing with the 8274-4 or even the Helix. You can use it for the smaller jobs or for edging or for getting into the smaller places where you don't want to be pushing a great big huge grinder into a small bathroom. So we typically refer to these machines once you become a contractor of that size and you've bought this 
five years ago, you're not parking it in the warehouse or leaving it in the trailer. You're still using it, and we call them companion machines for that reason. I think that's Does anybody have any questions? Do you want me to talk about this, Tom? So, so the question from um, the background, from really the brains behind the operation that's back here, the uh, entire marketing division for National Flooring Equipment is, what happens if you have a machine and you run into a struggle? It's not taking up the coating quick enough, or it's not opening up the concrete, and maybe your diamonds are glazed, or maybe your shot blaster is not working. I actually got a call from somebody that rented a National machine on the East Coast last night at 10.30, and he's like, oh, my machine's dropped a shot. He was really, really upset. And I said, calm down. You, you've reached out to the right company. We're all about service after the sale. And it really was just uh, a case of he didn't understand that he had to clean the filters of his vacuum. So I walked him through that. And he, load, he got a shot loaded back up. And we talked a little bit. And after about, I don't know, five minutes on the phone, he was up and running. And he was like, oh, I had no idea. This is great. I can't believe you answered your phone at 1030. I'm like, it's not a problem. Um, we're all about service after the sale. We, if you want to buy some equipment, um, or if you even own some equipment, it doesn't matter to us. You can reach out to us. We'll do personal trainings. Um, we'll talk to you about your equipment, its ROI, some of its consumables. We can teach you a little bit more in depth about the diamonds and the matrix and how to pair um, hard concrete with um, soft diamonds or vice versa. We'll spend time with you making sure you're getting the most production out of your equipment. And then later, if you've used your machine for this, this, and this, but you run into an issue, or if you're even bidding a job and you want to know what's the best way to tackle this, what's the best tooling to use, what's the right equipment, you can reach out to me, Tom, or anybody at National. The best part is you guys are only seeing us two on this video, but, but reaching out to National via the website or, or on the telephone, um, Facebook, there's all kinds of ways to, to have touch points with us you're going to talk to somebody that's an industry expert that knows what they're talking about. That's a huge benefit to you. Did that answer the question? So, oh, I was going to say, so when you're out on the job, um, I find this a lot. I get requests, especially with our smaller grinders. Hey, can you tell me what tooling I need to have with this grinder to be successful? And so I put together this really big package that's got some half bar diamonds, it's got some full bar diamonds, it's got, uh, so those are things that you would use to prep just concrete like this, or you could use them for coatings removal. I've got PCDs and carbide chips, and I really put together this package that allows you, the purchaser, to go out and be successful in whatever job that you come up against. And then guys see the price tag, and they are like, whoa, 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 Mr. Salesman, why are you trying to get this much money out of me? And here's the perfect example. I had a, a customer down in Texas. They did this to me. And I said, look, I think this is what you need to be successful. You could probably get by with this bare minimum of these three or four tools. The first job they picked was one of the tools that they eliminated because they thought that they didn't need it. They thought that one diamond was the same as another diamond and that they would be able to use it. Well, it turns out they had bought all full bar diamonds, which because there's a lot more diamond, there's less PSI, less pressure per square inch on that diamond. So the machine was less aggressive. And it turned out what they needed was half bar diamonds, which have almost twice the PSI because there's half the amount of surface area there. And as soon as they had those on the bottom of the machine, the job flew. So there's little things like that that you might say, okay, well, I have a PCD, but the micro PCD, like Dave said, cutting through in a, a thick epoxy coating, it's going to do it a lot better than those half domes. But if you put those on a floor where there's very thin coating, all of a sudden you're digging into that concrete and you're ripping it up and you're not just removing that coating. So when you're on a job site, even though, yes, we've talked about the, having the actual tools, the grinder and the shot blaster um, in your arsenal, also having the correct tooling, especially with the grinder to go with it, really makes a difference. And it's going to keep you in the job and it's going to allow you to get on and off the job site really fast. And we're very fortunate at National to have 
endless distribution points across the U.S. and around the world. So if you're out on a job and you find you need something, there's usually resources somewhat close by, depending on where you're at. But for the most part, it's like cell service. You should be able to get what you need pretty quickly, and we're pretty proud of that. Yep, and by having all those tools in your toolbox too, when you're on the job site, if one thing's not working, then when you call us and we help you troubleshoot through that, or when you are comfortable troubleshooting on your own, um, you already have those extra tools there to be able to solve that problem. So, how, <laughs> great, so guys will call us and say, I don't think my diamonds are cutting. Um, believe it or not, the best way for me, and I'll, I always encourage guys to FaceTime me so I can see if possible, is turn off your vac for a minute and just push the grinder along. If it's not leaving any dust, which is what you suspect that it's not grinding, you can tell your diamonds are glazed. Your diamonds normally will glaze for a couple of reasons. One is you're spinning your machine too fast with too much weight. It could be too many curing compounds and sealers and admixtures into the concrete. So to combat that, um, you can change the bond of your diamond to a softer or a super soft bond. Um, you can clean your tooling by running it in asphalt out in the parking lot or even putting sand and water down. If you're going to use water, you got to turn off your vac. But there's lots of ways to unglaze your diamonds if that happens. Um, typically, on the smaller machines, I see it not as much with the bigger machines. Someone's turning the machine too fast. They have all the weights down, and they haven't matched the diamonds with the concrete hardness correctly, but it's pretty easy to solve that. Um, and even to the point where you could take a Dremel tool with a little barrel sandpaper and clean it off, pop your diamonds back on there and go back to work. But if they're glazing, you should address why they're glazing. Just unglazing them doesn't really fix the problem. You should probably reach out to somebody here and um, ask some questions and let us talk you through it. And I'm, I've talked a little bit about service after the sale, but you guys, I'm Dave Bigham. My phone's on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I talked to a guy last night, 1030. I'm not I'm making that up. Uh, and he had rented a customer from one of our distributors. Not even technically a customer, but he, it's a national piece of equipment. So it, it means something to, to me and everybody that's around me that we take a lot of pride in our equipment and our company. We've been around since 1968. We're going to be here tomorrow because we have, we have made it our focus to take care of our customers, to listen to our customers, help them solve problems. Um, you can reach out to me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Holidays, it doesn't matter. Um, everybody else goes home for Memorial Day and Christmas and whatever else. Um, all the schools close down in the summer and everybody goes home and you guys go to work. I understand that and we understand that national. So we're available for you whenever you need help. Dave, just before you mentioned something, so, and I know I haven't talked about it yet. You said match the bond of the diamond to the hardness of the concrete. We haven't talked about concrete hardness yet, so. We certainly can talk about that. Um, that's a really important thing to match. Do you want to take this one? Do you want me to talk Go a ahead. little bit about I it? So. There isn't one bond of diamond. Uh, National sells three different kinds. We sell a soft bond, we sell a medium bond, and we sell a hard bond. To match those to concrete, it's actually the opposite. So soft bond, hard concrete, medium to medium, and hard bond diamond to soft concrete. And the reason why is that when you have hard concrete, you need to expose those diamonds faster. So by having a soft uh, matrix that wears away very quickly, you're exposing those diamonds and allowing the tooling to do the work on that really hard concrete. When you have soft concrete, if you were to put a soft diamond on there, you're just going to open those diamonds up all the time and you're going to shred through it. And you're going to call me and say, I don't have a concrete slab left because you sold me the wrong machine and now it's all dust. Well, that's because we didn't match it correctly. So a hard matrix on a soft concrete is going to wear away very, very slowly. So it's really going to only take that top layer of the concrete off. And obviously medium for medium, but Dave, how do I know how hard my concrete is? Because that sounds pretty hard to me. There's a, a lot of ways that you can uh, determine the hardness of your concrete. I believe we have videos available. How do we, can somebody tell me I'm, I'm the dirty guy, not the computer guy? Uh, my title is Global Director of Training, which is short for guy that gets dirty every day. I don't like my computer. Can you guys tell me how to access? 
on the YouTube channel, and it would probably uh, concrete hardness. Is that probably what it's labeled? We go through the steps, um, some real basic um, kind of entry level, how to tell if it's soft, medium, and hard. And then we also talk a little bit about some um, a little more elaborate, which I think most of the time is unnecessary. Um, and I think National even sells a concrete hardness tester. We do. Um, and you guys need to test more than one spot, but watch that video and it'll give you a visual of what we're talking about so you can at least be prepared um, on the front side when you're bidding that job to make sure you have the correct tooling. Yep. Any questions? Any you guys chat in your questions. questions There's tons of there. people online out there. We can see the count. How y'all doing? Well, welcome to Thursday morning in Denver, Colorado. Chat us in questions. We'd love to answer your questions. That's really what we're here for. We've spent our whole life on job sites with you guys. And everything that we've learned, we've learned from you guys. And we feel like we're networking, and this is a chance for us to get in front of the camera, not because we know something, but because we've learned something from you. And this is our opportunity to give that back to somebody else that might not have been on that job site or needed a solution for that problem. That's what we're here for. So a lot of times surface prep, like we sit, what's that? Oh, question, great, and then we'll go back to that. Question. No, the, the oh. question was, uh, you go into somebody's garage that's already been prepped once before, there's a failing uh, chip coat, there's a rubberized membrane, um, there's some coating or something that's already down. Um, can you just grind that? Can you just shot blast you know, the coating off? A lot of times surface prep is more than a one-step process. I preach that all the time. Guys want to take up glue, and they want 100% glue removal, and they want one way to do it. Um, typically, that's not the best way to tackle removing glue. Um, we discussed doing glue uh, our next session an hour, but you have, to, you have to use more than one process to remove that glue. Um, I can't tell you if the concrete, the condition of it underneath us rubberized coating or underneath this really thick epoxy until I remove it. So most contractors will go in and do a test patch somewhere inconspicuous in the building and they'll take a hand grinder in a vac, uh, usually a small vac and a, a small seven inch grinder, four and a half inch grinder, and they'll open it up so they can see what the concrete's like underneath it. They can um, determine if it's soft, medium or hard. And more than anything, they can see what the condition is underneath it. Because if somebody wants me to prep a concrete floor underneath a bunch of tile that's there, you have no idea what you're bidding. Um, that's like me asking you guys, do you think my wife's pretty? You don't never, you can't see her, you don't know. You can imagine that she's absolutely gorgeous and supermodel like I promise she is, but you wouldn't know that because I didn't give you any, inform any information. You wouldn't know, so you gotta be careful that you know what you're getting yourselves into. Uh, I always refer that back to managing your customer's expectations, which has been a big thing for me my whole career. You gotta really know what you're getting into and understand what it is that they're asking for before you can give them the answer to how, what's it going to cost to give me a CSP number two underneath this rubberized coating. Well, first you have to remove some the coating. There's a cost of that. Then you have to determine what the condition is of the concrete underneath it. So time and materials. Just, time and materials. Saying, so what I hear you saying too, it's not just one machine out there. It's not just one method. Absolutely. There's scraping. There's grinding. There could be shot blasting. There's a lot of other little steps that go in there, especially when you're walking into a situation where there's already something that's been done to the floor, is that you're not just going to be able to grind right away. Absolutely, Tom. All right, anybody, y'all right. typing in any more questions? All right, well, thank you guys. Thanks for we tuning in. Give it a little bit, but uh, I think coming up at 11 a.m., we've got uh, glue and adhesive for our next session. And uh, we've been talking a lot about this type of machine on the job site. You wanna be able to breathe clean air. You wanna, especially when you're running dust collectors, being able to keep all that dust and, and stuff out of the air. So our ionizers that we sell pull the dust and any contaminants in the air and drive it to the ground, provides clean, breathable air for employees, customers, and even in your own home. Uh, I've got one, I've got a Siberian Husky, and his hair goes straight to the ground instead of floating all over the house. 
Uh, we are running a special right now on our first generation of ionizers. So if you are interested, please reach out to us and we are happy to walk you through and talk to you about this great technology. Thanks so much. See you guys at 11 a.m. in about an hour. Thanks again. Hey, wait, come back. Thanks, Tom.